All right, this is the video on charge. So just to understand what charge is, we first need to understand what, what is the electron? What does the electron do? So the classical view of the atom is like a miniature solar system. However, there was a huge problem with this model. It, it just could not be stable. Atoms could not exist. And here's why. If the electrons were in orbit around the nucleus, like a planet, then atoms just could not exist. They would not be stable. The electron would be accelerating a radiation and eventually lose its orbit. So that's when in 1913, Niels Bohr proposed his quantized shell model of the atom to explain how electrons have stable orbits. And those orbits are in uh, parentheses because uh, electrons don't really orbit around that nucleus. Now, according to Bohr, the electrons just couldn't be anywhere. They could only be located at certain distances from the nucleus. So we say the, the electron orbitals are quantized. They have that energy. So you, you can do this uh, with an experiment. Like if you look at a neon light, you have like uh, little prism glasses. You can actually see uh, those color bands. So only certain energy or colors are absorbed or emitted. So this is what we call energy is being quantized. So electrons are only allowed to orbit, once again in parentheses, at particular levels. So photons emitted as electrons jump from a higher to a lower level. Uh, Higher to, yep, and photon is absorbed as an electron jumps from a lower level to a higher level. So you, you can see here that only certain elements can, uh, can like absorb uh, certain amounts of light, and you can have that. This is technique is used in like, you know, in space uh, by, you know, like by the Mars rovers, being able to look at certain like rocks and being able to say, well, what is it made out of? And it's done by this, being able to see, well, what, uh, what, what electrons are, are there when they, when they jump certain levels. Um, so the Bohr model is the one that, uh, that, that we use the most. Now, but keep in mind, the Bohr model is really inadequate when describing the atom. The quantum model of the atom does a better job of reflecting how electrons orbit around the atom. So it, it has to do with like a probability in a certain area. Uh, that's just, uh, that's just uh, how things work on that, like the quantum level. So, now, now let's understand a little bit about states of matter, phases of matter, and answer this question. What is cold? So temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy of the atoms and molecules that make up a body or substance. So kinetic energy is just the energy of motion. So a thermometer measures how fast the atoms and molecules are moving. So a thermometer is like a molecular speedometer. sort of measures the average speed of the molecules of a substance. And you can see there that it doesn't matter how uh, you know cold something is or hot something is. Like all atoms are moving. They're sort of bouncing around each other. They're vibrating in certain ways. So next time you're at a party and you want to impress everyone, and you know if you want to say this war this room is warm, you can say, well, the average kinetic energy of the molecules in this room is rather high today, isn't it? And uh, that's guaranteed to get a reaction, good or uh, bad. All right, so that brings us to cold. Like, how cold is an ice cool drink? Well, what happens is the faster moving water molecules gives up some of its their energy to the slower moving ice molecules, thereby losing some of their kinetic energy, which you would feel as cooling your drink. Some of the higher kinetic energy of the water transfers to the lower kinetic energy of the ice. So believe it or not, cold does not actually exist, which you're experiencing uh, when you experience cold is the absence of heat. So this was a states of matter uh, activity in, in which you look at the examples of solids, liquids, gases, and plasma down below. And to come up with your own definitions of each state of matter using the table to the right. So the first thing you do is determine whether it's rigid or not, determine whether it has a fixed shape or not, and determine whether it has a fixed volume or not. So you can see here, there's examples down at the bottom. There's a, you know, a, like a rock, there's some water, there's a air in a balloon, and there's a plasma. The best example of like plasma that we have here is like a plasma ball like this. So go ahead, you can uh, you know, pause the video here and do, do this on your own, determine whether it's rigid, fixed shape, or fixed volume. All right, so uh, here are the answers. So you should have gotten the answers the table to the right. So solids are, uh, you know, the rigid. They have a fixed shape, fixed volume. Liquids, well, they're not rigid. They don't have a fixed shape, but they do have a fixed volume. And gas, aren't rigid, don't have fixed shape in the fixed volume. They sort of fill the room that they're in. Um, now, plasma is a little bit different, right? So, so plasma down at the bottom, plasma and gas, uh, they look the same, but they, they, there is a different state of matter. Now, I did trick you a little bit uh, because that, 
that one on the left that looks like a solid isn't technically a solid. It's, it's what's called a bitumen or a pitch. So liquids are measured with viscosity. Water has a viscosity of 1. Honey has a viscosity of 2,000. Peanut butter has a viscosity of 250,000, but bitumen, that, that what looked like a rock, has a viscosity of 23 billion, right? So uh, you can watch a live stream of the longest running uh, experiment, uh, which is when they uh, melted some down, put it in uh, like a glass container, cut the, the tip off and watched it drip. And it takes like 8 to 14 years for uh, drops of this to happen. But... It technically is a lick, but just a little interesting uh, thing about that. All right, so th the first three states of matter that you should have come up with are, you know, solids, liquids, gas. Now, to convert from one state of matter to another, energy must be added to the system. Uh, if you look at your notes, you'll notice that two states of matter appear the same. That's a uh, gas and plasma. So that brings us to another big question. Well, what is plasma? So what is plasma? Plasma is the fourth state of matter. It's nothing more than ionized gas. So in the plasma state, electrons have been ripped off atoms, and we just have a soup of free electrons and positive ions. It's the most common state of matter in the universe, because that's like what uh, stars are made of. Also, uh, in between galaxies, in between uh, you know, the stars, like, there are these free-floating positive uh, you know, hydrogen ions, and you know, they have electrons. So it's, it's sort of uh, it's, it's the most common state in the universe. Now, it can be produced not only by heating a gas, but by placing gas across a very high voltage, as in uh, this example, that, that uh, the, 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 like plasma ball there. Right? So th this, is, uh, this is what plasma is, right? Essentially what you're doing is you're Now, it might be like, you might see like, well, that's got to be the same. It's the same thing as gas. Well, it does have different properties, and that's what we use to describe uh, you know, these states of matter. It, it is like gases aren't very conductive of electricity, but plasma is. So they, they just sort of determine that as like, a, hey, it's a fourth state of matter. So that brings us to this lab. I call it revenge of the pit. So in this example, what you're doing is you're taking a, a PVC pipe and a metal rod and you're placing it close to these pit balls um, after you rub them with some fur. So once you rub it with the uh, PVC pipe, uh, what, it, what, what happened uh, is it should have deflected these balls. Now then the next one, it says, we'll discharge them and then uh, by grabbing them, but then uh, touch the, the pith balls with the PVC pipe. And what should happen is it should deflect and it should start deflecting now and, and re 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 repelling. Uh, then the next one says, do that with the metal. Uh, and nothing should happen with the metal. And now, based on what you observe in this lab, which material has the electric effect and which material does not have an electric effect, well, you would probably say, well, the PVC has the electric effect because it made the pith balls move. And the metal doesn't because it didn't move. Well, uh, that brings us to electrostatics, right? So this is, that was just a good warm-up exercise. So if we recall that protons and neutrons are held together by the strong force while the electrons are bound to the atom by the much weaker electromagnetic force. So that means it's a lot easier for the electron to be stripped away from the atom. Now, this is the whole idea behind electrostatics. So for all of these problems, like if, if you're looking at anything with electrostatics, just ask yourself these questions. What do, the, what do similar charges or like charges do to each other? What do opposite charges do to each other? What will the electrons do? Right? So if you look at those like charges, they repel, opposite charges attract. What is the electron going to do? Because that electron can move, but not the proton. Right? And that brings us to this question, when transferring charge, why are electrons transferred and not protons? So let's just take a look at that, a couple of definitions before we answer that. Right? So electrical conductors allow the flow of electricity through them. Electrical insulators do not allow the flow of electricity through them. And you can see some examples off to the right, some examples of insulators, some conductors. Now, because the electrical effect could flow through things and behave like a fluid, people began to think of it as like an invisible fluid. Now, sometimes the pitfalls repelled, sometimes they attracted. Um, and this was the same experiment that Charles Dufay did, right? And he, he came up with the idea that there were two different fluid-like substances. Now, Charles Dufay made the same mistake that we all did with that pitfall experiment. Because metal is a conductor, he didn't like insulate it. So when he was transferring charge, if any charge was transferred, it flowed through the metal rod through him. Now that PVC pipe or he didn't use PVC pipe. They probably used some sort of natural rubber. 
or maybe like uh, amber, um, it, it, it does not transfer, or sorry, it, it does not conduct that electricity. So the electrons are sort of stuck in place. Eventually they'll dissipate, but they're stuck in place because it's an insulator. So if the fluids are alike, then like this is their idea. If fluids were alike, then they would repel each other. And if they were different, then they would attract each other. Well, that brought in Ben Franklin. And Ben Franklin was, was thought, okay, maybe there's not two different types of fluids. There's just one type of fluid. That kind of, you either lack this amount of fluid if you have a charge or you have too much of it. And it's just this fluid trying to balance it out. Now, Ben Franklin was the one that came up with the terms positive and negative for charges. Now, those are just words. It's what we use to describe the world around us. He could have used anything. He could have used up, down, left, right, back and forth. Like, it was any, the giraffe elephant, right? He could have used anything. And if you believe it or not, like protons and electrons don't have little positive and negative signs written on them, right? It's just a, some words that we use to describe the world around us. So that led us to an important conclusion. It, it is the uh, law of conservation of electric charge. Charge can neither be created nor destroyed. Charge can only be transferred from one place to another. And the total amount of charge in the universe is fixed. So the fundamental rule, like charges repel, unlike charges attract, just like in that example up there. So now because electrons are easier to move from the atom to the protons, when you rub one material against uh, another, some of the electrons get transferred from one object to the next. So when transferring charge, why are electrons transferred and not protons? Well, protons do not get transferred. They are held in the nucleus by the strong force, right? That's, electrons are held in place by the much weaker electromagnetic force. If the object gains electrons, then it becomes negatively charged. If the object loses electrons, then it becomes positively charged, right? That all that's happened is that these electrons are transferred. Nothing was created or destroyed. So why does a balloon stick to hair? So we're going to need to learn some key uh, things. We're going to know three different types of charging and two other important concepts. Now, the first concept we're going to learn about is polarization. Now, polarization is a process of separating opposite charges within the object. So the polarization process always involves the use of a charged object to induce electron movement or electron rearrangement. Electrons do not get transferred from one object to another. So uh, like what you can do, like if you look at that up there, there's that positively charged rod get close to this metal sphere. It's this conductor sphere. So what happens is, is that those those electrons, because they're held in together by the electromagnetic force is weaker than the, the strong force, those electrons are going to sort of move over towards that positive side. And notice that it's separated these charges. Now I have one positive side and one negative side. So now let's talk about the three different types of charging. So we need to know charging by friction. Charging by friction is the process of transferring electrons by rubbing objects together. Now the total amount of charge does not change. What changes is what object has more electrons. So if you look off to the, the right, you can see here that uh, that PVC pipe is being rubbed on the, the rag or like fur, and those electrons are getting transferred. Well, now let's talk about charging by conduction or contact. Same, uh, it's, it's, those words are interchangeable. Now charging by contact is a process of giving one object a net electric charge by placing it in contact with another object that is already charged. So if, if you look off to that example to the right, you, you can see here that uh, that PVC pipe has a negative charge. Now electrons uh, are opposite, or, or have this, sorry, they have the same charge. So they're pushing, those electromagnetic forces pushing away from each other, right? I, electrons don't want anything, but I like to think of it as those electrons are trying to get away from each other, right? They, they want to get away from each other. They want to spread out. And by touching it with the, like a, you know, some conductor, it gives those electrons the opportunity to do that and spread out. So that sphere becomes negatively charged. Well, then there's charging by induction. So charging by induction is a process of bringing a charged object near but not touching a neutral object. The presence of a charged object near a neutral conductor will force or induce electrons within the conductor to move, so just like polarization. Then the object can be grounded or separated uh, to charge the object. So you, you can see there that uh, the first thing you do is you, like, you separate those charges by polarizing it. Then what you do is if you look at that picture down at the bottom, you ground it, right? So now that brings us to our last topic, right? Grounding. Grounding is a process of transferring any excess charge of a charged object to another object of substantial size, like Earth. Provides a pathway for electrons to or from Earth. 
So if an object is positively charged, like you can see over there, uh, grounding it will provide a pathway for the electrons toward the object for it to become neutral. So the electrons will flow into that object. Now, if an object is negatively charged, grounding it will provide a pathway for the electrons away from the object for it to become neutral. So you can see here there's one that has a lot of that. And remember, electrons are trying to spread out, trying to get away from each other, touch it, and it's going to flow uh, away. It's going to balance out. It's going to be neutral. So lightning is a form of grounding. Right? So that, that's, those are those charges balancing each other out by grounding them. So now let's answer this question, though. Like, what determines which object gains and loses electrons when charged by friction? So why is it that one becomes negative, one becomes positive? One gives up the electrons, one takes those electrons. So that brought us to this static cling lab in which uh, we grabbed uh, three, or sorry, four different types of rods, three different types of materials, and rubbed them together, and we placed them next to an electroscope, which basically says, is there a charge here? It does not say, it, doesn't, it cannot tell you whether it's a positive or negative charge. Now, what you should get out of this one is, uh, if we answer this question, uh, what made the electroscope move, the rod being rubbed, or the material rubbing the rod? Well, I mean, I can look at this and I can say, uh, you know, the hard rub and the glass, they always had a charge. So sometimes the material either like, will always have a charge. You can see, look at the fur. The fur always produced a charge, right? Except for the metal. Now, the metal we already learned that that was just because uh, metal is a conductor, right? Uh, hard rubber, plastic, glass, those are insulators. But sometimes charge wasn't transferred. So this is what I want you to get out of this one, right? We know the metal is a conductor. That really doesn't have much of an effect. But like fur seem to have always transferred a charge. One way or another, we don't know. Hard rubber glass always transferred charge one way or another. We just don't know. Silk, plastic, uh, we, it seemed to sometimes but not always. So what determines that, right? So what do you, like, we know that, like, this last question, what, deter, what do you think the electroscope, why do you think the electroscope moved in some of the scenarios, but not all of them? Well, because sometimes the electrons are transferred, sometimes they weren't. This, sometimes they haven't. And the metal, in that case, it is a conductor. So that brings us to the triboelectric series. So the triboelectric series is a list that ranks materials according to their affinity or love. Like I put it in quotes, love, Electrons can't love anything, they're just inanimate objects towards electrons, right? Or sorry, the materials, right? Charging by friction is also called triboelectric charging. So what this means is that different materials want electrons more or less than other materials. The materials towards the bottom of the list have a larger affinity or love for electrons and have a tendency to go negative. The material towards the top of their list have a smaller affinity or love for electrons and have a tendency to go positive. So if two objects are being rubbed uh, together, the material lower on the list will gain electrons and become negative. The one higher up will lose those electrons and become positive. So this brings, that, this brings us to our conclusion, our final thoughts. Remember, there's just too much unknown in the universe to take a break from learning. Get out there and question everything.